Okay, we were talking about your teaching philosophy. So far we have covered sit in a circle, like people, and there's definitely a difference between literature and composition, and composition is your forte. Um, and, and just for preference, for people that are not paying attention to the, to the previous 30X videos that we've done here, John was probably the preeminent writing instructor at the University of Michigan for three decades plus. All right, so composition. How do you approach this? You want to teach people to write. Can well, kids coming into college write well, first of all? No, no. They think well, they think well, but they don't know. They don't have any, I, I don't know. It probably is the fact that you can't blame it on teachers in high school because they probably have 25 or 30 kids in each class. Maybe they teach four or five sections. That's 120 kids. You can't, you can't do what I, I devote three or four hours to every paper that I got, but I only had, you know, two classes when I was a mentor and then three classes the rest of the time, and I could devote my time to these, the, 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 the nuances, which aren't nuances because of synergism and the synergistic effect, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So, um, you know, a small minor error here and there is nothing, but the combined effect of all the small errors is huge. So I, right. I, I talked about nuances, I talked about minuscule points, and the kids found them interesting. So one what about, th oh, go ahead. Just one other thing I say, I think in order to teach chemistry, uh, engineering, physics, English, math, you have to have, the teacher has to have, a, I hope, have a vast knowledge of the subject matter. And uh, few, few people are interested in grammar and uh, rhetoric, but I am. So, uh, you know, I studied uh, for years uh, grammar, all different kinds of grammar and different languages and uh, all the great uh, you know, English masters of grammar and the American masters of grammar. Um, all right, H so you got to know your shit. H. L. Mencken, H. L. Mencken, uh, Partridge, um, so many other ones. Oh, uh, so Paul, Paul okay, Roberts. So Paul Roberts is a great book. Probably it's probably out of print, but that was a great understanding grammar by Paul Roberts. But anyway, so okay. I was well prepared with grammar, and no one. Got no it. One so baseline grammar. knowledge. I like grammar, though. You know. Good. Well, and hopefully people watching this like grammar because the title of the whole series has the word grammar in it. Yeah, I think that the but, three people that will watch this series will like it. <laughs> I think you're overstating our audience a little bit, yeah, but well, that's fine. Hyperbole. So what are you going to, part of the thing with your class was the w topics of writing. It's, it's, you didn't assign topics. No, I and, don't. When I was teaching and, at Purdue for five or six years, you had to have a textbook. And then you had uh, five sections. I can't remember what they are. One was like um, vivisection and then uh, sexual harassment. I, no, not sexual harassment. They didn't have it then. But uh, rape, child. I don't know what it was, but there were five sections. And there were five, five sections of a big book that was divided into reading material re regarding, say, vivisection. Okay? And, That'd be uh, a great topic for an essay, vivisection. Yeah, right. Because, of course, you know, no one had any experience about vivisection. So you had to get someone else's ideas about vivisection and then regurgitate them as if they were your own. Yeah. Of course, you're not, your, you know, um, copying them from some plagiarism for sure. But anyway, kids hated that shit. And so when I went to Michigan, I had a wonderful woman named Lillian Back. Great woman. Wonderful dear friend. Very smart. And um, she, um, she had this idea that, uh, and it was her words, make the private public, make the private public. And so um, what she wanted to do is she wanted the kids to pick a topic of their own choosing that they were interested in and then write about that. And then through that writing and through that writing, we did workshops. So uh, say um, every Tuesday and Thursday, we'd have a new essay, right? And we have one on Tuesday, one on Thursday, or one on Monday, one on Wednesday. And each student in the class would have to uh, write uh, an essay for the class to uh, digest and then to... Uh, but not every... No, they weren't writing two essays a week. They were writing three or four a semester, correct? And then you'd rotate through. They would make copies yeah, of right. their essay, but every, but hand every, them out. But see, every student had to critique the essay written in a nice, friendly, hospitable manner, you know, and they have to write between three and five pages every Tuesday and every Thursday. So they wrote an enormous amount for me. And then I would grade that for the content, not the, not the uh, form, because I don't care when you're writing evaluations. 
I don't care if you, you know, use the wrong words, have no segues, blah, blah, blah. But what is interesting, have you given the writer good advice for revision? Okay. And then it's up to the writer to decide if he or she wants to accept that advice. And it's a, it's a collaborative effort. It's not a competitive effort. I never cared about the grades. But, uh, you know, all the kids at Michigan had to have A's so they could go to med school, law school, grad school, make a fortune and support me in the manner I'm accustomed to. But uh, How's that worked out? For, have they supported you? It's amazing. Accidentally, not by design, but actually it's amazing how my students who have become wealthy have, have been kind to me. Very, very, very kind yeah. to me. Oh, they have. Well, and it's interesting you mentioned these, these um, critiques, as you, as you described, because having talked to several students over the years, both you know, informally and then writing the book about you, um, they often say that they learned as much from the critiques as they learned from oh, the class. Oh, it's so important because what you need to do in life, you have to go through and you have to tell people things that are somewhat negative. And so if you can learn how to phrase your negative comments in a positive fashion so as not to alienate your audience, you're a step ahead. And so therefore, I would, I'd have to give some back. Uh, well, not, not that often, but I can think of at least six or seven times I gave back. Said, you know, you're going to alienate the writer. You're going to rephrase this. Learn how to phrase your negative comments in a positive fashion. Say what's wrong, but then, um, you know, phrase it positively. Because your point is to help the person revise the essay not to alienate the writer. And so, boy, that's a valuable lesson. And they had to do that 20, 22 times, 18 times. They learned that skill. You know. How long were the essays that you were assigning? Was there a I length would, limit? or? Yeah, yeah, no more than five pages. Double, uh, space and a half or double space. So 1,000, 1,200 words, something along those lines? Yeah, max, maybe? At, max. At the max? max yeah. yeah. And then shorter was fine? Oh, yeah, shorter was fine. Like many people chose to write their essay for class, their personal statement for law school, med school, grad school, engineering school, and then we would rip it apart and make it personal. Because in the word personal statement, you have the word person. And a person has to come through a personal statement or you're not going to get into law school, med school, engineering school. Because so, I taught, so, mostly, those, I taught yeah. mostly seniors, so that was a matter of import to them to get into graduate school. Or get a job. Yeah. But, but I say this, if you have, if you, I don't know if you could do that in, in most universities because, you know, we're a very liberal university and I never got in trouble for the stuff that people wrote about date rape, about um, incest, about, uh, I mean, there were many happy coming things. Out. Yeah, coming yeah, out. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. And uh, there was but a, really personal a, there stuff, was, which is yeah, interesting. But, and if you write about personal stuff, then you have a, a, an emotional commitment. So then you have to learn how to write unemotionally about something you're passionately emotional about. You see what I mean? And this is a great So how skill. do you do that? How did they do that? Subject, verb, object, avoid, avoid purple prose? Or what, how, did you, how did you manage that? Well, I don't know. Teaching, just, uh, over, uh, as the semester progressed, and as I tried to teach them um, you know, how to phrase their negative comments in a positive fashion for that, or when they were writing how, uh, about not to, not to become too impassioned and forget there's a certain logic in your writing. You have to, you know, you don't go from point A to point Z, and then from Z back to point C, and then from uh, there to X. You have to have a logical progression uh, of your story, and oftentimes the logical pro progression is uh, uh, chronological, which is an easy way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, another way is to ask a question at the beginning of the essay, and then, uh, of course, that leads to the five paragraph essay, which is kind of boring, the style. But, uh, of course, depending on the content, it could be really interesting. But, um, and then develop that uh, five paragraph essay where you phrase the question and at the end of it, you answer the question. What's in, what are the other paragraphs? As long as we're there. Facts, details, observations to support your generalizations. Todd is right. a good guy. Todd is a good guy. Oh, really? That's gonna be a, that's gonna be pretty lean. Yeah, that'll be a very short essay. But, um, you know, then you have about five or ten paragraphs with details to show, not tell. You can tell me Todd is a good guy. Show me Todd's a good guy. Yeah. yeah. Right. Meaning anecdotes, setting a little bit of a scene, showing, uh, describing anecdotes. something that happened as opposed to your opinion of the yeah. person, you know. Or, or what's really nice uh, is uh, with a, like a reference uh, paper, which I never taught, but I, I try to in, 
tell them to use authoritative sources when you're talking about Todd, and maybe Todd was talking about something regarding uh, climate change, because he's uh, you're interested in that. Well, rather than just use Todd, use the authoritative source, a, a couple of uh, lines from the New York Times about climate change or something like that. Mm -hmm. So there's so many ways you can enhance your authority. Got but it. The key is so the just key, because they were writing. Go oh, go ahead. But the key is to me is to allow students the freedom to write about things that are interesting to them, not some assignment about vivisection that they don't give a shit about. Now, if you yeah. want to become a veterinarian and uh, or you're a PETA, uh, what is it? What is PETA? People for the Ethical, ethical treatment, treatment of animals. animals. Ethical, yeah. yeah. Well, then, uh, then write about vivisection from your own experiences. Mm -hmm. And how you worked in a vet's office, or how you worked in a lab when you were—they yeah. were testing uh, uh, that that uh, there was that controversy years ago about that uh, eye makeup or something. And they use rabbits' sure. eyes and There's destroy them. So then write about that. Lots and, of those, yeah. Yeah. Right. So write, well, and I think what you're what, getting at. <coughs> write what you know. Excuse me, <coughs> Julian. You're right. Gesundheit, Besser als die Krankheit. <laughs> <laughs> So, but I think what you're getting at is a, is a key point as from an instructor's perspective, from a, from a language teacher's perspective, a composition teacher's perspective, as opposed to a literature teacher's perspective, or if you're in a subject matter themed, you know, if you're in a pre-med class, then the writing needs to probably, to the extent that you're writing essays, you're demonstrating that you've acquired the knowledge. In this case, you're not demonstrating the acquisition of knowledge in a composition class, you're demonstrating your ability to share knowledge succinctly, perhaps, ideally, um, but accurately and compellingly, right? So in that case, why force somebody to research a bunch of stuff that they may or may not be interested in, and then, as you described, regurgitate it? So, if, you, if, you learn to, if you learn to write to an audience, you know, it's all audience and purpose. We've talked about that a thousand times. It's the only two yeah. constraints authors have writers, sculptors, you name it, audience and purpose. But if you are able to write to an audience about your own personal experiences and then you can do it in a clear and cogent way, then you can, you can write about uh, paramecium or uh, you name it. Yeah, so what you're saying, you can, you you can, can apply the knowledge that, that, yeah. You can apply the knowledge that you're gonna pick up by writing about something you know really well to your sphere, Later on. to your uh, sphere of uh, interest in life, yeah, you know? and stuff that and, you may not know as well, because you know how to convey information in, a, in an effective way. Yeah, and, right? and you'll have you'll have a certain confidence, but you'll feel you know good about it. Got it. All right. Well, let's let's um, wrap that because we're we're at a decent length. Is there more on this topic you want to go into? Do you think do you think we've covered uh, your entire teaching philosophy developed over forty uh, x years? Uh, well, teach what you love. It goes back to, you know, what I've told you, you many times. You only need those six words to be happy. Quid pro quo. You get out of someone to put it to it and scratch your itch. So teach what you love. Or do what you love. And scratch your itch. You know, the same thing. You know, I think. Don't you think? I think you're, you're right on. Yeah. yeah. Well, problem thank is, you for that. Problem is, many people never find out what they want to do. Want to do? I didn't find out until I was. Uh, let's see, probably f I got my PhD late in life, so probably I was like, well, 1975. I was 35. That's pretty late to find a, a career. You know what I mean? Yeah, but you managed to do it for another 40. So yeah. it's never too late. I suppose you could argue, right? Starting yeah. early is better. Starting late is oh, yeah. better than not starting at yeah. all. So love what you all do, right. and love what you do, and do what you love. And I think you'll be a happy man. Or you could be a happy woman if you have breasts. <laughs> Good point. Good Thank point. You. Well, we'll wrap with that fabulous point. <laughs> Thanks, John. Oh, goodbye. Bye.